Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge. I'm thrilled to have our next guest, and she's got a unique blend of Western medicine, indigenous traditions, feminist principles, and contemporary sensibility. We've got Susan Lipschutz, LC, LCSW. What's that stand for? Uh, licensed Clinical Social Worker. Ooh, and she's a sacred feminine activist. She is deeply devoted to building strong communities that reawaken and integrate the sacred feminine into daily life. And Susan strives to weave the wisdom of our grandmothers with her own powerful modern teachings attuned to the complexities of today's challenges and evolutionary potential. I love it. Susan has studied with prominent, well-established teachers, ceremonialists, and wise elders who've generously given their blessings in the form of teachings. And in 1999, Susan founded Everyday Medicine Woman, which offers workshops, meditation courses, special events, and retreats to provide women with intentional communities to heal inherited cultural losses and remember our beauty as individuals and as a nourishing, resilient collective tribe. Susan has maintained an integrative psychotherapy practice based in Chicago, that fuses in-depth therapy with indigenous principles and evolutionary tools like astrology and Akashic guidance for more than 30 years. In addition to her private practice, Susan offers mentoring, meditation, and women's leadership consultation services for businesses at a local and national level. She has a seminar series called 13 Moons, which explores the reanimation of the sacred feminine through the life cycle completed and it completed its 13th year. Her annual goddess gathering retreat is now in its 18th year. So for more information on Susan's work, please visit her website at everydaymedicinewoman.com. And you can find her on Facebook and Instagram under Susan Lipschutz. Also, she has really cool astrological updates and events and a monthly podcast called Moonwise hosted and curated by Moon Tent Co. Thank you so much for being with us, Susan. It's such an honor, Katie. I'm just thrilled. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have this conversation today. We are going to be talking all things uh, sacred life cycles. So we usually start off each episode with an exercise. So if you want to just get comfortable and close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees. And just think about what you were doing and who you were with and see if you can identify a favorite. And when you've identified the favorite, reflect about which three words you would use to describe its personality. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and share about what you were thinking, what you were up to, your favorite, and the three words. What's interesting is, and it may be in reference to before we started the podcast, kind of talking about city sounds, because I'm sitting in my office, but being a city kid, my landscape was often informed by all that was going around me in that way. And what's coming forward, interestingly enough, is I lived in a part of Chicago growing up where there was a multi-ethnic community. And so what I would walk by every day going to school was the equivalent of what we call a bodega in New York. Mm -hmm. So it was an open area of this Italian, small Italian grocery store, and they had the flowers outside. And so that's what's coming to me are these beautiful bouquets of vibrant flowers. So I'm, I'm just feeling all of them. And I'm really kind of tuning in more to the variety that was there, you know, the iris and the roses and uh, chrysanthemums, you know, just all. And so I'm seeing lilacs and vibrant yellow and pinks. It was really beautiful. And I remember buying those periodically, even as a little girl for, for my mother and to bring them home. So I guess what I'm feeling with them is vibrance, captivating, and happy. Mm. 
so beautiful. What we find is that the the words you use to describe your childhood favorite typically will describe the way that you bring your biggest and best gifts into the world, which makes sense. A variety of offerings and vibrant and captivating and happy. Does that resonate? It's beautiful reflection. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's just jump in. And I love how you say that as women, we're innately cyclical with the moon. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for me, it's, it's at, at a personal level, that was an enormous discovery for me. I remember the reference point that, that just, I would say, reframed everything was when I was on already what I would say is more of an awakened spiritual journey and really looking to express myself and discover myself and work with individuals that I could learn and be from and also help heal my body and restore myself. It was really looking at naturalistic kinds of approaches. And I had just started seeing this acupuncturist and she ended up being the person who gave me the pamphlet to go to see the person that I ended up working with. One of the people we all did, you know, in terms of working with someone in, in a spiritual community and, and learning quite a bit. So the first, the, one of the questions she asked me was, when did you start your moon time? And I'd never heard that expression before, and I didn't really know what she meant. She says, when, you, when did you start bleeding? When did you get, start your menstrual cycle? And that just, you know, completely blew my mind because it was this sense of your moon time. And it was very unfamiliar to me to see myself and to reference my cycle as that as one could be reflected in the moon. So then I was off to the races in terms of, you know, really looking into that and really understanding what that meant. It was all part of this opening up to being part of spirit and being part of nature and, and re-referencing myself in accord with in a very, very different way. So this notion of starting to understand that rather than, you know, everything, I mean, the calendars and everything we look at has to do with a reference from the sun, that stationary viewpoint, everything rotated around the sun. And that was very much, I think, our experience of being enculturated in a, a patriarchal masculine sort of Western world, you know, around, we rotate around that notion of the stationary principle. And then as I started to see that we were in fact changing, ever changing, that we were our own process in, in that way and how the moon reflected, even though it was whole all the time, as we know, it's always whole, uh, we had that expression of moving through all of these different sort of variabilities and what it really offered us to understand ourselves. And so then beginning that process of tracking the moon time, understanding that you know when we not that there is any right or wrong, but if we could utilize that being in harmony or what happens when we start to connect with the earth, connect with nature, really see and feel ourselves as reference to that, would in fact our, our bleeding, our moon time actually correspond with a new moon, sometimes a full moon. You know, that experience of a lot of women go to college and they, uh, or later if they go to older summer camp or whatever, and they all go, why are we having our periods at the same time? And it's like this really primal connection that we all link up to. And then we're kind of moving in rhythm and in harmony in some way. And so in that sense of understanding what the, what the benefits, and I don't mean that benefit in a way that is something that we call to us and we can, we can manipulate, but it's more of a sense of allowing ourselves to go into harmony. Bleeding on the moon time is a natural time of a death and a natural time where living by the land, the moon was really that which created a reference point on how we grew our crops and when we cut different kinds of, you know, trees and um, a sense of, of when we were full in our fertility, so to speak. And then when we were more waning in that sense of coming into our understanding. So, you know, in that beginning, the new moon starting the cycle, half moon kind of really building up, waxing, empowering, full moon, everything open to see the blossoming of what we've planted. And then the waning really, like we always say, we, we learn when we've been through something that the, that waning moon, you know, really offers us the wisdom of the, of whether we call it the, the month. And then when we have eclipses, it's more like every six months or two years, it's a, a bigger empowered kind of cycle. Just seeing and feeling everything is a circle, everything is a cycle. And, and for women, 
connecting, as I say, more into that notion of the medicine wheel for the feminine in that lunar cycle. Because if we really looked at our whole adult life, you know, uh, it would be starting at that moon time in the way of, oh, we're growing our lives. It could be childhood too, when we think about it, that, you know, and then that growing into our empowered uh, calling, the sense of the fullness and the mother energy, and then that sense of the eldership or the waning, and then the death, you know, the, that balsamic moon the day before the new moon is that dead of the moon. It's when, you know, everything sort of comes into complete understanding and releasing like the, the butterfly and the chrysalis. So it was uh, the moon being my, probably my greatest muse, you know, in that way of, of really ever teaching us so much about the cycles and then seeing even when we look at astrology and we start to understand a lot of the mythic story, that they're all about different cycles of goddesses, stories, relatable, right, that are bigger, archetypal, that we can relate to at different times, depending on where we are in our cycle, can be named and understood in those ways as well. So it's just you know, endless in terms of those understandings. And I think at the same time, very practical for ourselves in understanding how to be in harmony with that which we're manifesting in our life, how to be in harmony with when we're in times of healing, in times of looking within and, you know, needing to do some some really deep shadow work in times when we need to claim our power, you know, and so forth. So it just gives us a little bit more of a sense of syncing up with what can oper- make it a little bit more opportunistic for for us in context. It's so helpful in life to know that we don't have to be on all the time, that there's ebbs and flows and, you know, times to go and times to rest. And and I think that's such an important teaching. I wondered if you had any favorite goddess stories that you wanted to share. We don't hear enough goddess stories in our culture. (laughs) Oh, I know. Well, that's why we all love the goddess cards, right? Because then we can get read them about them. You know, it's so much fun. They're just complete magic, you know, and bring these different decks. You know, I used your flower deck card. I think I I mentioned it to you when we were working with the spring equinox. And I put them around this flower offering that we did. And then everyone took the flower. They each, each selected three. Oh, my gosh. The whole room just, it was so right on. And the women were so excited and excited to then, you know, pursue the essences, but also just even the fact of being in the presence of the, of the flower as the remedy, even in that moment, homeopathically, it was so beautiful. So I, you're, you're one of the goddess stories, Katie, with, <laughs> the, you're the flower goddess. We would, what would that be? Flora? Uh, fauna? <laughs> Flora, That's so sweet. You know, we'd find you a, we'd find you a beautiful one of the, of cultivating and, and bringing forth the, uh, the the medicine and the beauty of the flowers. Oh my goodness, there's so many. I think what the moon goddess would be Ishel, which is in the Mayan traditions. And she's the the goddess that is felt to be, you know, in in different traditions, many of the the grander goddesses hold the three three goddesses, like Kali, you know, Artemis, Athena, Medusa, Ishel. They hold the maiden, the mother, and the crone. So they evolve in their different forms they might have different names sometimes they have one name like the corn mother the corn maiden the corn mother you know and the corn which would be the third embodiment would be more of that elder and you can see them you know living in southwest all the little fetishes of the corn the the corn mothers and the seven sisters and the three you know the 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 sacred perfect foods and when they come out so we see them so and they represent symbolically but ishal is very powerful i think that when i that's when i first got like another Another version of my own rite of passage was when I went to take the women, it was the first time we left from a local or a near local Midwestern to uh, Mexico to do the goddess gathering. And I had been to Mexico many times, but you know, I was here with the women. And so it was sort of a different experience. And I was turning 52, which is considered eldership and, you know, in the Mayan tradition uh, in terms of when the different kind of clock rotations come together or counting. And, um, and so I had this experience of just feeling the power of the manifestation of, of Ishel as, the, as a creatrix. In other words, as this, as this energy that was not only overseeing and supporting the oceans, the goddess of the oceans, you know, where we begin is our, the amniotic fluid. So it's, we carry that 
goddess of the, you know, we carry the oceans within us. And then when we return to the great mother, you know, the, and, the, and many traditions talk about that, that women are carriers of the waters and learning to pray over the waters. So Ishal, but just that inspiration of being there with the moon being, it was a, actually a half moon. And I remember standing outside, I was at Tulum and there was a half the sun was right there and the moon was right there, you know, and they were both sort of bookending me. And it was just this moment of, oh my goodness, you know, being, being in a whole different level of cosmic and earthly awakening of this sense of really being connected in a, in a very different way that informed me. But so the goddess Ishal, you know, has a lot of different uh, stories about her, again, as it relates to moving through the time of birthing to the time of midwifery of, of death, you know, in those, uh, so it's not bound into one storyline, but a lot of times you'll see her in the, as, as represented in the full moon by the waters, you know, and how she's informing and all of those things. But I think we, we have a lot of them. We have Artemis, you know, who invites us into rewilding and has that, that beautiful, fearless quality and connected with the moon and the wolf, you know, and her archery and just at the springtime, you know, in that Aries energy of forging and being connected to uh, the pioneering of new places and new lands. And, and one of the, and the, the fire goddesses is my reference point more to the menopausal times, because a lot of times when we think of our lunar self, then we also need, because we're all elemental, to also understand the fire, right? And so, of course, there's different ways like Pele, you know, the fire of awakening that moves through us, or Shakti that informs at a cellular level all the way through and awakens the chakras, awakens our vibrance and awakens our sense of, of into form, the vitality, the dynamic, the sexuality. But there's a particular, these sort of more mature goddesses that don't kind of coddle us, but they more say, um, we love you so much, we're going to challenge you to step into the fire and become the fire. Because you know, when we're standing near the fire, it's pretty scary. But if we were to become the fire, it would be a very different story. We would be inside the kind of the center of the flame. Will I like a, a curl, you know, if you were surfing, uh, which I've never done, I can only imagine. <laughs> but that the zone, right? How do you get in that zone? And so these more mature fire goddesses, one being of, uh, again, in my limited interpretation, not having been initiated into a intergenerational lineage of Kali, but going through different experiences of that, where they're really saying, you have to face your fears because light creates shadow. And I think that's, you know, one of the most daunting times in our lives as women in terms of all of us moving through that rite of passage is reaching menopause and then what it what it brings up and what it tears apart and, and kind of what it asks of us deep within us. So it's a it's a more formidable, scary kind of confrontation with that, you know, with that particular energy. Yeah, having having not gone through menopause, I look I listened to you talk about the goddesses and the 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 different stages, the maiden. Okay, I understand that. The mother. Okay. And then there's the crone. So why is it that, why is it in our culture, we're not very familiar with the crone and the, the power of the crone? And, and is it because of facing those fears? I think it's multifaceted. I think too, I, I, I'm going to mistake her. Donna Hain, I think is her last name. She wrote a book a number of years ago uh, about the, the queen energy and talking about that just as a, again, a reference as a fourth, because we think of maiden, mother, crone, but we're more contemporary. And so there's a power, there's a power arcing in there that I think when we shift right into crone, we lose a sense of, and I think our lives are very different than when these original archetypes over time, you know, this is something that in our, our culture, we're always reframing and shifting in our moment, what is evolving, we're always ever evolving. And so I think that this, this piece of our power years or being empowered, being women unto ourselves, it's also like when we say the, the mother archetype, it's a real turnoff because a lot of women don't have kids. They don't reference themselves. They haven't been called into or given rights and privileges of you know, mother archetype, but they absolutely mother. I don't know any woman who isn't in her 30s and 40s are, that isn't deeply referencing from something inside themselves that calls to be unconditionally loving of someone else, picking up everybody's energies, giving, you know, giving in that really deep way. 
it doesn't matter where or how. And, and in some ways, that's the source of our, our, how we get sick is because we don't, you know, really understand that that's what's happening. And so I think that takes a lot of women away from even the mother archetype. So I think we have different ways that we want to reframe languaging. So it's inclusive of, of our entire life cycle, no matter what we do. We don't. So if we don't have a child biologically, does that mean we're a maiden until we go into menopause? You know, like, no, of course not. You know, and even the word maiden just sounds so puritanical or something. <laughs> right, right. So I think the languaging really kind of turns us all off. We want to relanguage it to be vibrant and full in our own authoring right of our lives but I think um, so to me I think as we're on it also gets into our obviously this is all fueled by in, in many ways are informed by our procreative organs our reproductive system like bleeding we start what we're 13 and we go all the way to 50 or whatever it is unless we have a surgical intervention and, and again everybody is different and and so whatever that happens but it's a long amount of time that we are in relationship to a menstrual cycle and to if we're if we're heterosexual to also having to navigate our fertility and you know and all those different things so so that's all like kind of a big part of this right and so then as we as we go through menopause i think what what happens is wherever that shifts us, it disrupts us from our homeostasis in such a profound way. Now, it doesn't mean some women don't have a lot of physical symptoms. I did not have a lot of physical symptoms. I had, mine were emotional and spiritual and they were very intense and very deep. Some women have very difficult symptoms. But when I looked it up, it was interesting because when I looked it up, you know, good old Google, just to see a reference point of well, what's going on in the world. <laughs> and it was just, you know, 36 remedies for these 15 symptoms. It was, everything was informed, except for Christian Northrup, in terms of a body of work. And of course, uh, there are other women and Demetria George, who does this beautiful work in cultivating um, goddess and archetypal and anthropological and you know astrology. But that's few and far between. If you're not in that world, you don't have reference. But very few and far between about, this, about the spiritual rite of passage that we go through when our lives suddenly, internally become completely disrupted. Like, you know, women will tell... they. The beginning is, oh, I have a two, it's every two months, every three months, it's, I'm bleeding a lot, I'm barely bleeding, I stop, and then I start again 11 months later. I mean, that's just in and of itself. It's kind of like, think about when we start our periods, you know, and it's like, it takes years until that first drop, and then until what, it can be several years before it really regulates. So it's that process of how do we, when we're young, we, our whole thing is about hiding it and keeping going, not understanding it and welcoming it and seeing what it means to us and how it means not only to our physical hygiene but to our sense of becoming women and and the mysteries that go along with that and so forth so as we're moving out of that without any kind of eldership to support that or any anyone who is helping us consciously and intentionally understanding that and speaking to us about it then we're all just, you know, and I think even so many women have to self heal in that process. And I think it's, that's empowering and confusing in and of itself. How do we find our own answers? You know, it's, it's like, everybody's talking about it. And, and, you know, I watch it on Facebook all the time. It's like, what's everybody doing? The, the hive. So getting back to that, when you ask that really important question about what happens to the crone, I think it's because we are considered or the culture has for generations and when this is really amped up in the last few generations is if you aren't young and attractive and useful in that particular way you know the culture many women will tell me they're they're really nervous and a lot of times they'll even go to some sorts of surgery because they're they feel that the minute they start to look old they will be replaced and particularly in corporate america you know, yeah. So, so as a from a sense of work and empowerment, even though that's a time when they're frankly more empowered and wiser and better, re, so much more, you know, to offer their 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 work world, they're considered to be marginalized and on notice, and so that puts them in a way. It sort of dis, disconnects us, like when we are really empowered at ten and eleven, and then we get our periods, and we almost never recover that level of, you know self-esteem and self-confidence and audaciousness again you know for, for a while um, this can happen for women too is that they start to feel irrelevant they start to feel invisible they they don't feel like there's a place for them in a modern culture and so they you know we see that all the time women just continue to want to extend the that youth 
youth oriented and a lot of men will, you know, the women talk about that and men will demonstrate that again if they're in heterosexual relationship that they'll, because of their own fears of aging, they'll be with younger women and so have a second family. So again, not a judgment of being right or wrong. I think it just creates women start to get smaller and in that concern about those things. Um, and that word, right, the word of crone makes you kind of like, what do you envision? Yeah, I remember one of my roommates when she was going through menopause, she always described it as like she felt suddenly like all these things were going on in her body that she didn't understand. And she said she described it as almost like feeling like going through puberty again, like in adolescence, yeah. like she didn't understand what was happening. All these things were happening and she was a little bit confused by it. <laughs> and I think that like as you were saying about when you were Googling information, we tend to, it just turns into like pathologies, right? We've got exactly. symptoms. What do you do about the hot flashes? What do you do about when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep? But nobody's really having this bigger conversation of what's actually going on. Like, yes, I, you know, there, there are physical reasons why there are hot flashes, but what are the energetic reasons? What, like what you're saying, what, what are the emotional and spiritual rites of passage that are occurring at that time? And you talked about, it brings things up for us. It, it tears things up. It asks things of us, inside of us. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just as another, again, honoring our those who came before us, Vicki Noble, who did the Mother Peace Cards, you know, about, I don't know, what, 25 years, 30 something. She, in her Shakti, I think it's called Shakti Woman. It's, um, my book is uh, tattered. I love it so much. And she has one of her chapters is, is on menopause. And it's, you know, talks about how the, fi the hot flashes sort of in that process, it's, it's taking the energy from that womb space, lower energy up into our heart to animate the passions of our power. And that it also has, there's a medicinal thought that in this hot heat, in that higher temperature, perhaps it's burning off pathogens or things that we've accumulated in our lives. So even from that point of view, I don't know if, if anyone would uh, concur with that, but uh, I do believe it is that fire sort of rite of passage. And what I'll say about for me personally is what ended up happening was because my own activation of, even though I was a spiritual and you know spiritually oriented sort of in terms of getting lots of astrology charts and seeing psychics and all those kinds of things, I wasn't embodied in that. I didn't reference myself that way. I didn't have a spiritual practice, you know, and, and I was starting to meditate. I was working with someone, but when I had my first daughter is when everything broke through. So it was through having this experience of a natural childbirth that just cracked open through the most primal way. What started to happen through my work, through my visions, through hearing things, seeing things, my reference point, my relationship to the feminine, to having uh, you know, the, this experience of nursing and feeding my child. It was all such a miracle, it was so profound. And it was not something I ever thought about. I wasn't like a baby person. I think I, I, think I held a baby once before then. It was, like, <laughs> it was just not my thing. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely a calling, let's put it that way. But I totally fell in love. It was like Dorothy, you know, black and white to Technicolor and all of this. So then I became this like mother, you know, mother of, of uh, these children and mother of the world. And, and so I created as I was shifting this model in my own work, in my practice and into from, you know, group therapies into medicine circles for women and just all these things were happening. Great. But I wove them all through the, through my own that particular time I was in in my life, which is the mother. So everything was me giving and me giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and, giving and just this production and, and the creation of everything came out of that matrix. So as I went through menopause, I was primal and I, I, everything, like I remember sitting at a goddess gathering and this woman said to me, and it's really an incredible compliment. It horrified me. She said, oh, this is so wonderful. I'm going to bring my, I can't wait. I'll bring my children and my granddaughters. And, and all I could think of, is, oh my God, I'm doing this for 30 more years, like all this work and, and all this responsibility. And it was, it, it just felt like it was, it was smothering me like a snake that had to shed her skin. And so I found myself, I did, it, it was, you know, I'm a Capricorn. I mean, I was thoughtful about it, but I was basically, <laughs> I was tearing apart this web that I built, that I wove so lovingly because mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. I couldn't walk in it. And, it. and it was primal. Like I say, it was, 
it was like, I have to stop this. What is the time frame that would, would be honoring everybody enough to step away from this and to do something fresh and different? And it shocked me. And it hurt a lot of people's feelings because it was a loss of something that was created. But it, it was so compelling to me. And this sense, and I, I think about that a lot with women, you know, women who go through menopause often, if they have kids, they often have kids that are teenagers. Now they have kids that are like 10 years old. And so it, they're looking, everyone's like, you know, kind of unraveling in the house. Everybody wants freedom in the house. And everyone is just sort of having that sense of, of awakening and the disruptive energies. So it's sort of fascinating at that time. But I will have women who will say to me, I feel so guilty and awful because they're starting the menopausal process where their children are young. And they're saying the last thing I want to be, and it has nothing to do with my unbelievable, dedicated, devotional, heartfelt love for my children and my family. I need to break free. I, 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 I have to find time for myself. And, and, you know, sometimes even people will call from college and they, their mothers, you know, cling on their every word. And then it's like, uh, they don't even answer their phone. And it's like, why didn't you call me back? You know, usually we say that to the kids, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's the mothers because they need that freedom. So in terms of that experience for me, um, it was, again, as I say, it was shocking. It was, it was really quite primal in that sense of, and the, so the way that I speak about it now is in that disruptive energy, something that stops and disrupts us inside, I do believe as the completion of the rite of passage, something outside of ourself has to also be disrupted. It's sort of our task and challenge. And that in that menopause, the pause from one lifetime, from one era of our life to another needs to be honored and needs to die. And we don't know what it is. We can't, we can't elegantly fit, figure this one out, right? Like, as much as I try, <laughs> you know, it's like I always try to do that. Oh, I think I can control my shadow if I do this work. And then I'll, pick, I'll pick what I'm letting go of, right? Don't, have you ever been in those like corn cutting ceremonies or all this stuff that we do? And it's not that, like it's kind of that, but it's, it's just, it's, the truth is sneaky that way <laughs> in terms of our healing. So it, yeah, so it was very, very challenging, but I do believe that we discover what is no longer serving us. And it might be that it's in the middle of its creation. It might be that we're carrying it, that we've completed it. So it can show up in relationships. It can show up in our interior healing crisis. It can show up in our work, you know, and sometimes it aligns with very particular astrology cycles that often, and what's interesting is if it hits around 50, that's when Chiron returns in our chart, which mm -hmm. is a time of deep healing and recovery of our vital life force. So that in and of itself is quite fascinating, becoming awake to that timing of who we really are. So I, I you oh, know. No. <laughs> I thought, oh, yes. I thought 40 was really, really hard. <laughs> well, we all have an age, right? But, <laughs> but yeah, it's hard, but <laughs> it's so empowering. It's freeing. And not, I'll tell you just like not a as an bit. age. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. As, a, as an okay. event. Well, there's ages and events. There's ages exactly. and and you know, and they're right. And these life cycles and passages. So that's what I feel like. But it's really funny when I was in 13 moons when I do the menopause one. What I found is the younger, it was so exciting to have the younger women stay because when we go through every single month, they're recovering, we're recovering elements of our life cycle that then we, you know, we string them together and we have a whole necklace that we can look forward to. And so the younger women, um, it can be a turnoff to think we're going to talk about menopause. I think I'll skip that one. But the, the diehards, <laughs> the beauties would come. And we were so appreciative of them there because they left feeling like they understood their mothers. They left in the way that they understood. They looked back at their lives and went, oh my God, she was going through. Like they, we said it, but they didn't understand it. No one, even the mom, like no one has languaging for let's hold space for this woman who is dissolving in front of us, but wow. to recreate in a totally different way. But there was a story this woman gave, which I loved so much. I always retell it. She was in her thirties and she was working at a high school and she talked when we started early on in the session about menopause and she was talking about the women, she says, especially the administrators, because they'd been there for a long time. And she says, these women in their 50s, you know, she goes, they're so grumpy and they're bitchy and they're short with us and they're always in a bad mood. And I said, did it ever occur to you that they're going through menopause and they're your elders and they need to be given a little street cred here. And they're fire goddesses. And so after we went through the whole thing, she said, I went back to school and they were all like doing their thing. And she said, I walked in and I said, ladies, 
I want to honor you. You are fire goddesses. And they all looked up and they went, what? And she said, yeah, I was at the <laughs> seminar. And I realized that you all, you know, are care, you know, you've all been through so much and like you're into this powerful time in your lives. And, and they were just lit up, she said. And then it was a big joke, like everybody, you know, to kind of tag them. But she said it absolutely they came alive because they were reframed and reflected a whole different kind of idea, not being marginalized, invisible, and important, you know, stuck. And that's the thing is we get trapped in our own irritation and then we become irritable. We get stuck in the birth canal, but we're coming out, you know? Right. And I remember, um, I remember a woman in my, I don't think my mother ever came out of her menopause and she had it very early. And I think it was really a, a con contribution to her. She, she died at 69. And I think it was, uh, she never achieved her full life cycle and, um, you know, lots more stories with that, but, but she wasn't, she really wasn't supported through that time. And I remember there was a woman in our family who she went through, and I think if we think she went through what I think she, she went, uh, you know, I think she was, went through an institutionalization process. And I think she even had ECT at that time. And it was all during, I reflected back going out, oh, she was in menopause. Now I'm not, downplaying and discounting that people have true difficulties that become more problematic over time. And that's the other thing, certainly when your hormones dis destabilize, that can deeply, you know, create problems in terms of just other ways that we experience the symptoms and so forth. So I'm not trying to just put everybody, oh, it's, it's a, you know, it's all normalizing that either. But, but I think we could all think about there's at least one woman in our family who we were told had a nervous breakdown and everybody hushed about it and didn't talk about it. And if we think about it, it's probably postpartum or it was over, during menopause. I mean, if we really link it up, these are destabilizing times that, that no one knew how to care for except to hide them. So most of the women on my team are in their 20s, like 25 is the median age. What would you say to them about so like what actually happens during menopause? Like what happens with the body? What happens with your emotions? What happens in your mind? What's actually happening? Well, I think I would not be the best person to speak to what's happening biologically because that's not my, that's not my level of understanding. But, you know, in this destabilization where the, you know, the estrogen drops in terms of just our reproductive system, you know, not producing the eggs and all the shifts that go around with our, our cycle. When the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, when the, when the starts to flag and shift and the body goes into it, doesn't have that regular homeostasis, what starts to happen is we feel, we are informed by, because we're so bio-spiritually, hormonally, you know, that's so much a part of who we are. And so as that all starts to shift and we start to be unknown to ourselves, and, you know, we start to have, again, that sense of whether it's untethered feeling. Again, it, it can come very subtly where we just notice that our periods stop. Other women, they have experiences where they really are bleeding all the time. And then they have different sorts of difficulties. But we, we often look at it in terms of our, the, the, the evidence, which would be our, you know, our blood. But it also can be in that. And because we're tracking our fertility, if that is an issue, that can be a part of it as well. But, but I think from a, from a spiritual point, from an emotional point, it, you know how PMS feels? I don't know what your PMS experience is like, if you have kind of a mild PMS or... Not emotionally, but just like, yeah, I'm super mild. I don't hardly know it's there. Yeah. Well, that can start to shift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, isn't this fun? Uh, it doesn't always, <laughs> but it can become a little more coarse, like a little mm -hmm. more aware as we're getting older because our body is is starting giving us little warnings. Well, I do notice though that the that most of the women in their twenties have really strong symptoms. Like they, okay. they're yeah, they're really right. noticing it. Okay, so if we're looking at that, put let's put us on the lunar map again really fast and okay. say so if we're going in the waning moon cycle and we're revealing to ourselves what we've just been through. And think about if all the oxytocin and all that good hormones are sort of they're not there to give us the bumper card or the rose colored glasses or, you know, that sense of warm and fuzzy, like we don't see things through that way and feel them. We're more raw. So when we're, when we're in it, then we're more in a truth telling mode. So what ends up happening is when we're in that PMS time, when everything gets, it drops all of the, the elements that keep us like in that homeostasis of, you know, being okay. Or like what drops, people 
like what people say happens right before you have a baby, like when you're in labor, you're just exactly like, oh my God, I don't want to tell you the things I said. Uh, it was just <laughs> oh, wild. We want to know. <laughs> yeah, we want to know. Um, but <laughs> the yelling was helpful. But it's a time. So all the pleasantries the, and the formalities drop away Okay. in those moments when we have PMS because we're just too raw, you know? And when, but however, we start to tell the truth. Like the things we're thinking, but we don't Powerfully. let ourselves think right? Powerfully. Powerfully. Or we say it now, we say it maybe too blunt, but it is something that we're holding back or something that we haven't seen. Because again, waning, being revealed, we don't have the ability to kind of make it all nice. And we say it. So I kind of kid people and say, yeah, in some ways, you know, going through menopause is like two or three years of PMS. <laughs> you're raw, you're bottom lining, you're feeling just you're in a truth telling mode. It's harsh, you know, in that way, not all, you know, not again, all the time, but that's what I felt. I felt emotionally. I, like I said, I felt, I felt gripped by truths uh, that weren't necessarily in hard ways, in new ways. I felt inspired in some other ways, but I couldn't grasp it yet because I knew I had, you know, in working with um, indigenous teachers and cultures and lineage, they would talk very much about the metaphor of garden and weaving. So they would similarly say, you know, if your weaving got off track, you can't just keep weaving. You have to unravel the elements where you weren't weaving the pattern correctly, and then you start to weave again. Or if you're gardening and your soil's not right, right, you have to take the garden apart. So similarly, I believe that menopause starts to take apart where we got off track or where we're done with where we have to go. So sometimes it is subtle, but sometimes it's very abrupt. Okay. So just to clarify, when you're talking about menopause, you're talking about that specific window of time where you're transitioning from one thing to the next. And when you say the body is, is not in homeostasis and it's seeking homeostasis, it will once again. Exactly. Okay, because sometimes I think that when we're younger, we think we go through a certain period and then we're just sort of off. For the rest of our lives. Exactly. Offline. Yeah. You're talking about a very specific transitory window that we're moving through. And then we find our stasis after that. If I think we do, but I think we have the potential to do it so much more masterfully to a, to truthfully and more fully live those elements of our power years, our destiny, our elements that we cannot really hold or understand we get we have aspects of it and we do deep beautiful work or whatever it is right when we're going through our lives but i do believe that this this is this shifts us if we can fully understand at a heartfelt deep deep level lovingly respect what the potentiality is for our total life cycle if we're not just, you know, kind of stuck in that place of you thing and go, go, go. And we have to, and, and this is a fun part that I'm seeing about, you know, the younger, like your whole team's 25, like uh, that, that younger women, and I'm working with, I love these younger women that are coming to my circles. and They're just so awesome. And the thing that's almost, it almost makes me, it's annoying is like, how do they get this? It took me 30 years to figure this out. How do they get this? <laughs> like, they're just so amazing. They're pre-wired. They're different. You know, they have a different spirituality they have a different understanding a different download sensibilities they've learned they see through it so in any event they you know there's this there's this interplay and dialogue so so this sense of okay there are so many things that we can move quickly into places of really kind of jumping into something that we really want to be in we don't have to necessarily discover it for 20 years but a lot of times we're told we have to we have to optimize it right away we have to write that book right away. We have to figure it out right away. We have to start the company. We have to do all these things. And that's great if you feel it. But then you may hit some places along the way. It's just the nature of we're not only about what we're producing. That's the, sort of the yang. It's what we're being, the inner, the intuitive. It's like we want that fast track instant soup kind of, all right, I just want to get intuitive. And it's like, well, <laughs> that takes a while, you know? It's like growing a baby. It's like something that we we cultivate. So similarly speaking, if we start to see, you know, that many times because women, whether again, we have children or not, because we go through this 
this ups and downs, all these things in our every month that we're feeling and that we're moving through to really hold the deepest part of our work or the deepest part of our understanding or our deep experience, we need to be stabilized in a totally different way. So if we can appreciate that, go through this time where we're completely destabilized, again, into mystery. I think that, you know, the sense of stepping into mystery instead of, you know, this notion of being in the unknown and living in uncertainty. And I think that illness and rites of passage like this really take us into that space. Right. And now we're all in that in the world, right? We're living in uncertainty. But if we can find a way to live in uncertainty and step into mystery, and especially in this time, knowing that we're dissolving, but knowing that we will come through, like you said, and just trusting and having faith in that and preparing for it. It's really, and having the faith in that and having the excitement for it while we're going through birthing ourselves, because that's what we're doing. And labor is tough and it's ugly and it's sweaty and it's messy, right? <laughs> Just like, the, you know, we're, we're, we're messy as women. We're bleeding and we're, you know, we're having all these, like, you know, we're sweating and, and we're crying because we're loving things and feeling it all. And so when we, but when we birth ourselves, that's what we're really doing at that time. Mm. That's what we do when we come into a spiritual awakening. We're always birthing ourselves. But I believe when we go through medicine, menopause, we're really, we're the midwife, we're the womb, we're the mother, and, you know, we're the baby, we're all those things. Well, and not to mention all of these different physical changes are occurring, right? right? I mean, I'm, I've got the gray hairs coming out. I see yeah. that I'm aging. I look at the photograph of me the other day and I was like, oh, I almost have a second chin growing there. Like, isn't that interesting? And like, I, I remember my roommate saying like, when she went through menopause, she was like, gosh, my skin is just so she had this funny word for it. She calls it crepey. She's like, yeah. my skin is so crepey. Wow. Like, that's so interesting. And she was like, I just almost felt like it happened overnight. Mm -hmm. And so like our appearance is changing. Yeah. We might not feel as sexy. Like what's, what's absolutely the, like, absolutely. How does aging play into that birthing ourselves? And how do you feel about the term aging gracefully? Uh, we were, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I would say that's absolutely true. And I think, I think the remedy or the, or, or it's not anything rigid and it's not anything militaristic, you know, it's not like the sense of, okay, now you, in order to own your power of menopause or to move into your crone or, you know, your, that you, you um, don't address whatever makes you, f whatever continues to source a sense of, I want to say authentic beauty our way, not what the culture tells us and not what the, you know, what the male gaze tells us. And then unfortunately it's the female gaze because we've internalized that so much about how we have to look or who we have to be. I love the models. I mean, you look at Helen Mirren and Jane Fonda and, you know, it, whatever that means about what anyone has chosen to utilize in terms of you know, I always laugh and say I could never do anything to myself because the karma would be so bad that I would probably end up with like God knows what. Like I could never like, you know, do any of those whatever it is that, that people do, you know, in terms of the, the you know. Like changing of, your face? Yeah, yeah. Like so Botox like or? Right, right. Any of that. I would just be like, forget it. The talk about, you know, karma. But I, I used to have a lot of judgment and I just like, you know what, whatever anybody feels, I just hope they do it for themselves. And I hope that it's a learning. It's always a learning for all of us in terms of how to walk with our lives and, and continue to feel good in our bodies and feel source a sense of timelessness and source that sense of, uh, right? But I think, so in that way, the way we can capture it and the way we can inspire others, I think is a really important, important, ever-changing and re reference point, something we need to reflect on. But that notion of aging, I mean, it's true, we're aging. I mean, it's, she's absolutely right. The, the skin changes and the wrinkles and the when you you do lose your your relationship to actual physical libido for a while and you have to go the thing that's kind of i guess i want to say interesting about it is you have to go stalk it and so that's part of i think one of the assignments is okay you had all this now you got to go stalk it which is one of the things that we do when we go through spiritual training in a way it's like you know we go stalk your dream your dream is stalking you. You know, it's that sense of how do we get real, really, really kind of connected to a way that we can forge who we are again and reclaim ourselves and that soul 
and who we are now with that in a different in, in, in you know a different way. So yeah, I think we do have to rediscover it, and I think it's really challenging, and it hurts our self esteem, and it can be really hard on relationship if there isn't capacity to to speak about that together honestly to share it's so vulnerable to share your body when it's changing that way and to have those fears and men have them too and that's where i think a lot of people lose each other and lose relationship because it is such a tender time when we're aging women and men and we're supposed to be not be any different and so i you know i think that's part of it too is the is the tenderness of that time but so I think that, yes, absolutely, there is real, there are real things that happen and real remedies. I mean, that's, that's the thing is there are beautiful remedies that are available and some work for other people and some not, and there's different considerations. So it's not to say we're just going to like, oh, we're, we'll be totally natural uh, in that sense of not taking care of ourselves and not creating that, that new, you know, balance. But I think it's just to do it, I guess, from a more authentic whole and never feeling there's something wrong with us. What really bothers me is this tag now which is perimenopause because what is that all it, about? well it's really just saying you're going into menopause it just means it's the para it's the pre mm -hmm. but that's fine but now it's become this medical diagnosis mm -hmm. and so all these women are talking about oh I'm, my god i'm becoming perimenopausal and they go into fear it's and like having the, a medical diagnosis for your period well that's what i'm saying yeah <laughs> and so it's like to say to the women you know just please don't get into that that sure. medical kind of idea about it and don't go into fear about it because like anything else when we get afraid everything exacerbates which is understandable but just educate and ask questions and hope that there's women out there that can also be guides but in terms of aging i guess you know a lot of times i'll see this how to rate how to age gracefully and i bristle at that a little bit only because i feel like and it's probably just my trigger but i feel like it's <laughs> almost inviting us to be to have a, a one note, like, okay, now we're going to wear pastels and be, I remember somebody gave me a pastel, <laughs> gave me a pastel scarf. I forget. I think it was like my 60th. And I was, I was like, sort of wanted to, you know, like burn it because, of it. <laughs> and it was the sweetest thing. And I know they spent a lot of time in it, but for some reason, I think it's maybe when we talked early on and you said, you know, the vibrant colors I felt as my childhood. It, and it's not that I don't wear them, but it's just, it was like this, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to put on, that's not my uniform now. It's just like, you know, cause that's not a little bit of a rebel. So I was like, no, but I think it's just that sense of age the way you want, like age with integrity and age with you know, grace, like grace, but not gracefully, I guess is what I would say uh, in that sense, that it happens the way it happens. And it's, it's a continuum. It's a walk on the road. It's not like now we're relegated to graceful aging as opposed to what, you know, like. It doesn't have to be graceful. You know. It can be messy. No. It can be fiery. It can be. Yeah. And there's more. I'm, exactly. And that's why I call it like that juicy badass, you know, like we see those incredible women that are now, you know, a lot of photographers will follow that are walking down the street and they're wearing their, whether it's a leather jacket and their pink. I'm not saying everybody is that artistic expression, just like not everybody has tattoos and all that and not to glorify something, but it's just, you know, express it how you want to. One thing that's really cool is we don't care as much, you know, in that way. So that's cool. But you don't have to care in a way that means because I don't matter. Don't care in the way that, it, that I can, so I can really reveal myself. And one other thing I just want to say, I remember very young in my life, I had this incredible opportunity to, to go study for a period of time in Taos, New Mexico, uh, in art. And I was working with these artists and one of the women was, she was in her late forties and she came from Detroit and she was a potter. And so I met all these people and a lot of women who at that time, and this was 40 years ago or something, I don't remember, but it was a long time ago. And it was all these people had left their lives, changed their careers, moved to a different community where mm -hmm. they could really devote to what their heart was calling them to do. And that was part of that time in their life, that rite of passage, they fully expressed it, but that was a handful of people. And not that everybody was supposed to do that, but I think in some form, that's my big thing is something when the internal disruption happens, it, it, in order to be fulfilled, something is no longer serving us in our outer life that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause I, I live with several roommates and the majority of which are older than me. And so I've watched them go through the different phases before me and it's so it's so endearing actually to watch someone age 
like to watch the facial structure change. I just find it so endearing and so sweet. And there's something really like beloved about it. And I also see that there's this like, like you're talking about cultivation of inner power and inner knowingness and wisdom and saying it like it is and being really fearless and courageous. And I think now, I mean, like, God, I'd never go back to my 20s. I would never go back to my 30s. Like, I'm very happy where I'm at. And I think it's because no matter how I physically age, there is that that, that cultivation of inner strength and knowingness and interconnectedness and power that is like, you'd never want to give that up. And it's worth it. Like, it's exactly. worth it. It's worth it to get out. So I can imagine, so I, not having been through menopause, I can only imagine that being on the other side of it is like, hell yeah. Like now yes. I know myself even more and I'm even 10 times more powerful and impactful. Would you say that's how you feel? Yeah, and I think that it it unknowingly also helped me. I had I had the resources that I could tap into from some of that inner experience of going, you know, and then the expression of it that then helped me as I went further down my life with other challenges, I had a reservoir to tap into that was a function of not just as you say, like you have a reservoir that you can tap into in your 40s that you didn't have in your 20s. And so it keeps accumulating in that way that we, you know, can truly tap into that we can source the resiliency we can source the faith, even though we're being challenged in a new way. But that accumulation, kind of like a, you know, every year when you look at these orchids, I mean, orchards, and you say, you know, oh, wow, they took so long. They're in their baby stage. And then you come back to them or trees, you know, these beautiful trees that just keep getting older. And, and through, we honor older trees, right? We say, oh my God, they're so old. They're ancient. They're beautiful. And so if we could do that with the feminine more, and we could see again, eldership. And I think that's a lot of what we lost in ways where we had these broken experiences because, you know, some of us have had grandmothers who've had that sense of restoration and honoring around the wisdom that they carry. But because we don't value age and we don't value, then they lose their resonance and they don't see themselves as valuable as well or much to share. And so in that sense of us, that's why I say honoring our elders. You know, I remember in hosting three of the 13 Indigenous International Council of grandmothers that I hosted in Chicago and we it was a workshop day and the grandmothers talked all morning and several of the women came up and said are we going to do something <laughs> and and I said you're going to listen you know and I remember talking to the grandmothers and they said yeah you know they don't understand that the most powerful thing you can do is sit at the feet of elders and listen and you know that so that sense of us slowing down and really understanding that we're absorbing it's, you know, it's, it's not always about the that experience of what am I getting, but what am I receiving from this wisdom, you know, and that comes out of us knowing that as we get older, that the, that, that eldership really can establish. But that's why it's so beautiful when you see older people and you start to asking them about their stories, because that's when they come alive and that's where their, their medicine, that's where their wisdom is but if they don't feel like they have anything it's not current they don't know how to work a cell phone or they don't you know they keep being shown how they're limited as opposed to bring forth where you hold history and you hold relevance and you tell us where we've been you know and that's really beautiful so it gets back into I think the more we can hold space for ourselves in saying keep going and don't worry about having like that notion of I have to do it all in the course of what you what your calling is in your heart and in your being as a woman, you'll get there. But if you allow it to understand that some of it needs to sit in the ground longer inside yourself, and it needs to be activated by d different life lessons, if we try to truncate, you know, like pull it all together right away <laughs> out of that sense, it, it can't be, it, some of it unravels anyway, and then we see, right? And then we find, we, often we link up to it anyway. But if we just slow down a little and calm down, that yes, if you feel inspired, go do it. I mean, absolutely. It's just understand that it's you're only looking at a longer life if that's what's meant to be that will allow you the opportunity to create and express and give to the world that whole different quality to it, you know, in that sense. Do you find, Kitty, I want to ask you about this. I noticed that in the FES, working with the flower essence pomegranate, 
that it was considered to be more in supporting women transforming from individual mother to world mother or world server. Do you find that to be true as well? That like what flower essence would you recommend for women going through menopause mm. or cultivating that? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there are flowers like Hong Kong orchid that come to mind that are for <clears throat> like falling in love with and embracing and accepting all aspects of ourself. I mean, that's probably something we could take our whole, our whole lives as we're yeah. changing, yeah. but also about not having fear about being seen and heard. Yes. And I think that's really important. There's also white magnolia comes to mind because it's all about embracing divine timing. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. Sort of like what you're talking about of yes. transition times. I mean, it can also even be used during death process. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of like what you were saying about there's no rush, you know, and like slowing down and working into that transition. Definitely. And I think utilizing when we think of menopause, like the pause part, that there's going in the disruption, there's time we need to be in the mystery, be in between those spaces where we're not one thing or we're not another. You know, the butterfly comes to mind in that. My very, very favorite uh, reference for menopause is regenopause that Barbara Marks Hubbard says. I love that so much because she says that, that we're in, we regenerating through menopause. And then we, we come into that time when we're, you know, our most vital self and we have our greatest story to tell and we have our biggest work to do. And who could say that more than a woman in her late eighties, you know, who has just been waiting for us to grow up to her <laughs> uh, in that way. But I love Regenopause because I think that's, again, that, that Phoenix rising, you know, uh, the Quetzalcoatl, whether we use that model, you know, as a feathered serpent rising from the ashes, that the rebirth and that rebirth that comes from the fire. So that's why I love that fire goddess time of what that really means and to really, you know, kind of really encourage women in our lives who are going through that and bringing that back to our mothers and our grandmothers and coworkers and so forth. So I know we covered this, we, we've covered this absolutely, but if you were going to sort of summarize and say, what would you look forward to when you're going to go through menopause? I think you, you could look forward to less inhibition mm, because that. you can't control it <laughs> <laughs> you are out of control so let's look at that you know it all the things that create fear for us if they were let's let's look at it that way everything that creates fear for us if we could see it without fear like we wrote it down and said three things that scare us about it or scare us in life yeah. and say okay but if you didn't have fear about it would you look forward to it so you know in that way being able to speak truth being able to go after what it is you needed and give that to yourself because again we're usually so uncomfortable that we we do need to do that so it's it forces us in some ways to take care of ourselves you know in some, in in ways that we deeply need and i think looking forward to for women who certainly who don't want to be concerned about fertility it's a wonderful way to not worry about birth control or timing in that way. Again, if, if that's a way that you express your sexuality and that's the partnership that you have, I think that that's being free, you know, even though we, 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 it, is a, it is a rich and beautiful journey to have um, our monthly moon cycle, it is also difficult and requires attention. And being free of that can be, you know, real liberation. So that's another element of it. So I'd say there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of liberation on the other side and during it, there is a discovery as you are ripped away from who you thought yourself to be or all the energy that it takes to show up a certain way, you discover different elements of yourself that you bury along with the hiding of elements of self that you rediscover. So it has a natural, all the elements of a rite of passage, all the elements of a, of a very solid vision quest are, are in play. That's why I feel like that. We don't have to go sit on mountains. You know, I mean, we bleed every month and we go through, you know, we birth and bleed and don't die and go through menopause. I mean, women, women are, uh, just in going through a life cycle, are really afforded when rightly seen um, all of these rites of passages that are so profoundly, have within them the ability to, to awaken within us uh, deep, deep, sacred understanding. Oh, it's such a pleasure to hear your perspective. Thank you so much for being with us. 
any last little bits of wisdom that you would share with anyone of any age or some piece of advice or suggestion that you often find yourself sharing lately? I'm a talker, so I can share a lot at all times. So it's hard to go like, what's the one thing? I do find that utilizing over and over again to say that that the moon is our muse and the moon is our teacher and the moon is our magician and that there is just gazing into the moon and um, allowing the, that sense of a gateway into understanding our lunar self provides us endless discovery of our own magic and our own mystery and our own ancestry and our guide. So I, I often will refer and keep teaching about, and teaching meaning just the, the facilitation and guiding of discovery for women to have that intimate relationship that they have, but they haven't been able to just translate. And so I think it's just look up, <laughs> look up and start to get to get comfortable with looking at, all right, what am I feeling today? Oh, let me look at what sign is the moon traveling through? Oh, okay, because the moon governs our emotional sense. You know, what is our moon sign in our natal chart? What's our Venus in our natal chart? You know, those are two points that give us a sense of cosmic direction, cosmic guidance, and also internal feminine. And I think as above, so below. And then, you know, feeling how we're feeling as women through that and reinterpreting that allow us to also understand that we are deeply woven into nature. Wow. I love that. So good. (laughs) Thank you so much for being with us, Susan. It's such an honor. And again, for more information about Susan's work, please visit her website. That's at everydaymedicinewoman.com. It's such a great name. She's on Facebook and Instagram as Susan Lipschitz. And she has a podcast called Moonwise that's hosted and curated by Moon Tent. So check her out. And I just want to invite, if you're in the Chicago area, which I know you are, Susan, we're doing a flower lounge on June 15th on Friday. Are you going to be able to make it? Are you, I, you couldn't keep me away. Yay! Absolutely. Okay. I love your flower lounges. They are transformational. And the women definitely, you know, send it out to, to my, uh, my community. But the, the women I know that came just loved it. We all just, we were in ecstasy. That's so great. We've got another one planned on the 15th. So if any of you listeners are in the Chicago area or you'd like to fly, we already have people coming from Louisiana, Ohio, I think uh, Georgia. It's pretty, pretty wonderful. So you can meet meet all of us on the team in person and meet Susan. And we're doing a flower flash mob on the 16th, handing out flowers to random strangers in Chicago. So thank you again for listening to the Flower Lounge podcast and we'll catch you next week. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.